When the quarantine started, we wondered how we could get some beautiful information out there focused on sharing healthy ways to live and raise awareness about COVID-19. Hey everyone, my name is Seth Eckert and I lead the creative team at The Furrow, a studio based in Lexington, Kentucky. We just finished up a collaboration focused on raising awareness and sharing healthy ways to live during the COVID-19 pandemic. Information on how to wash your hands is incredibly important, but we also wanted to supplement that information with taking things a step further. So we gathered information from resources such as the CDC and the World Health Organization and formed short statements that were either based on general guidance or facts. To make this collaboration successful and feel cohesive, we knew we needed a brief to get everyone on the same page. We used the brief to outline the subject matter per shot, outline the deliverable specifications, and to build a visual identity for the project. Our hope was that these guardrails would give the artists room to flex their creative muscles and at the same time keep us all aligned. We relied on this format and design style to unify everything. So this included the color direction, mood, and a style frame. In building the mood, we selected geometric and abstract compositions as the scenes would be grounded by the text per frame. We chose a color palette that had enough depth to mold to each concept. And finally, we built out a frame to use as a foundation on how style, mood, and color could all come together. After we built out all of this, we started to see who might be interested in helping us out. It was really cool to get to hear back from so many artists who genuinely were excited to come on board and help us out. I'm continually hyped that I get to be a part of this awesome design and animation community. Again, huge shout out to the amazing team that sacrificed their time to come on board and help us with the project. In efforts to further impact our community, we wanted to share some insight into how some of this was made. So we're teaming up with the School of Motion and the motion designers who built this outstanding work to break down some of what took place in creating these visuals. For this video, I've got Victor Silva from Ordinary Folk joining me and we're going to be digging into his project files. The time-lapse effect that Victor produced turned out so great, and we wanted to dive right into how Victor approached this effect. We'll get to see how Victor used a combination of layer styles and expressions to rig everything together in a way that made the animation lift more simple than you might think. You'll find from looking at project files like this that in some instances, a clever rig can be all that you need. I highly suggest downloading the project file and following along with Victor and I. You can find the link in the description. So Victor, as you got the the frames back, I know um, Emily uh, designed uh, the frame here, and she made this really cool scene that had you know the central object. Uh, you know the the scene in particular was you know COVID nineteen can remain viable on surfaces for hours to days. Um, so like. I know like she was kind of thinking about like having this central shape. I know she mentioned, you know, this idea of a uh, uh, time lapse or a, a progression of time um, and the, the surface itself and the design was kind of like that, that plane that she kind of created under that central shape. What were some of your initial thoughts as you got the frames back from her and thinking about, you know, the framework that we had kind of developed for, you know, things needing to loop, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when I first got the bio, I mean, I knew, there was like lightning changes. I didn't really read like a brief right 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 from the start. So I just like tried look at the file and like try to figure out like what movements would be. It, as it always happens in projects. I mean you just get a frame and you kind of guess uh what what's happening. Sometimes you get a, like a more detailed briefs brief, sometimes you just don't. Or you know, you can ask if you don't know. So this time, I don't know why I didn't ask in the beginning. I just went with it. <laughs> uh, and she, yeah, Emily, I asked had, later. Emily had made such a great frame because I know, like, you know, she was kind of thinking, you know, hey, like the shape could be progressing through space. Um, you know, so I, it, was, it was pretty self explanatory, I know, from, from your all's perspective. I think Emily really set the file up well. Um, yeah, yeah. So I know, like, through that perspective of like having that, uh, you know, some of those like compositing effects that she had developed, I'm pretty sure I think that she did some of those in, in Photoshop. Um, so when you saw the files, were you thinking, let me take, you know, what she's built here and animate it? Or were you thinking when you looked at it, hey, I, I'm going to probably have to recreate this in a different way? Yeah, since I saw the, like the lightning would change uh, throughout, the, throughout the piece, uh, it just guessed I would use layer styles, so it could control control the light more, lightning more precisely to do what I wanted. 
especially for like because if it's just like a circle it's fine you can just rotate it so have the light from different angles but if if you have like a square or something you can't just rotate it so that that's that's where the layer styles would help. Yeah, so like, I guess looking at your, your file, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the layer styles and, and how you leverage those to influence the lighting? Uh, sure, um, let me get one here. And so it's pretty simple actually. So uh, just look at, first, like look at the file and try to see the different layers that she used and then try to recreate it. Uh, so this is just a gradient overlay. There is like there are expressions here that uh, links to to null in the main comp that I can talk probably talk more about later. This position thing is just for from a early test. I didn't end up using it. So and this is the the link to the main comp that I told you about. So I have this uh, as a base, then. So, so what these expressions are controlling? So you've got, I guess, the position changes and then the, the angle changes. I guess. Yeah. Is mostly, the mostly the angle. So is the is the angle just the the way in which the gradient ramp runs off? Yeah. So if I change it, you see like the gradient ramps just like rotates, so it can reflect the lightning of the main scene. So does that expression that you have there, does that kind of point it towards a null or does that um, just let you control it? Yeah, it goes up to this uh, control here. There's a like light source that controls every uh, the light for like the entire scene. Like, every object's linked to that. So everything can be cohesive. Uh, and also like in the case of this, in the, of this square, it also like if, the square is rotating here. I want this rotation to be here too. The expression, so it can account for that. So it's always pointing up uh, the bright side or pointing to whatever it should be pointing according to the light uh, null. And then just like building up the, the layers. So this is just a shape layer on top. It doesn't have any effect, but uh, there's like another like a shadow and then have this other shadow here to reflect uh, what Emily did in the design. So you did like uh, a handful of these. So it's like you basically kind of take that same effect and then kind of multiply it. Yeah, so I had like a base ones. So like there's a square, a circle or a sphere. And so, and then I duplicated them and made uh, and changed so like the values of the colors. To, so we have like, like just variation, and also there's this guy here which uh, came later on. Uh, yeah, I guess you want to talk about the worm guy. Do you do you want to pull up your your cinema file? I know originally I think it was just kind of like a, a shape layer that you know we kind of like noodled around. Um, yeah, but then I, I know we talked like we talked about like kind of making it like a little bit more dynamic, and so then it looks like you you pulled this into cinema. <laughs> Yeah, so like you can see like uh, what's left from the the early version, like just the spins that I never deleted. Uh, that's how I was animating it before, and then uh, then I jumped into Cinema 3D once you had the idea of making it more dynamic, uh, which is pretty basic. It's hard even for me to like remember exactly what I did because I don't use Cinema 4D on a daily basis. But so it's a cube. Basically, I, I, I started with the cube and then extruded it to get like this shape and subdivided it so we can have something similar to the design. Applied some joints in here and then they just animated them. So when you built uh, this, did you build the cube out like just like a straight cube and then you you rigged it up and then bent it into its current shape or? Yeah. Did, I see. So I guess like you, you built the joint structure out first and then you were able to, to rotate it to get that like kind of noodly feel. Yeah, so yeah, so this is what it was, the modeling in the first place. So started with the cube and just like started extruding the faces to I get this shape that I could uh, subdivide and get it roughly as the design was. And then I applied the joints and was able to 
just move it around. Yeah, because I think you had to like kind of run into the the central cube a little bit, like it and it kind of like bounced. It looked like, and then it kind of rotated around. So I guess like I oh don't... yeah yeah because yeah because that that yeah because like in here it's just like the joints animating. That's what what that's what it's doing. But then when you get into After Effects, uh, there's where the animation is actually. The, yeah, because I was going to ask. I guess like so. Did you just so you pre animated what you had in Cinema? And then did you kind of know the timing of when those bumps would happen? Or did you kind of just like guess and then just kind of make do? No, this is all random. Uh, the the way the joints work, they're just like randomly animated. So it have some kind of movement in there. And then once I comped everything, I kind of had the, the this animation uh, there from the previous ver version. And then I just uh, tweaked it uh, to interact better with the square. And then you have like the the rotation. It looked like it kind of like bumped into it, and then it kind of like rotated around. Yeah, they do. Yeah, that's cool. So I guess, did, but so the rotation added, is also in After Effects. Yeah, that was that's what I was going to ask. Like, I guess so. Like the rotation happened in After Effects. Um, yeah, that's like one of the, some of the, like the true power of you know Cinema 4D versus After Effects. Yeah, because I also can time remap things here too, right? Mm -hmm. So I made it just made it work. Uh, well, going back, I guess, so you had a little bit of like a, a blurring effect happening across a lot of this. Um, I know, I think you used, uh, was it wide, uh, wide time? Uh, wide time, yeah. So yeah, that, that is part of part of the process to figure out how the time lapse uh, would work. And like, I know I had, I had some things in my mind. Uh, uh, one of the things that I use as a reference is like one of the your old videos of yours i have i have to show this set sorry oh man but this one <laughs> it's been so some it's, time yeah it's the first time i saw uh time lapse uh doing ha, ha, being done in animation so i i, I used this uh, as a reference and so a couple of things that i noticed like posterized time being used and some jump movements in there and something that i noticed from like uh time lapse in general from like from doing it in the past like uh Usually there's some expo exposure flickers just because of the nature of it. So I just try to like add those things in here. So exposure and then it's like a wiggle that is connected to the this two sliders. So you notice in the beginning it's not you don't have this time lapse effect and then like it builds up, then it goes back. That's why there's uh, those sliders connected to the wiggle. So those amp that amplitude, I guess, is that just kind of like a wiggle effect? Yeah, so those, that yeah, is yeah, yeah. expression. And then you just ramp it up. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then like on top of it all, uh, as I was showing my coworkers here, Greg had the brilliant idea of using this CCY time effect, uh, which basically what it does is uh, it acts kind of a, as an onion skin from like traditional animation. It kind of, uh, it brings the amount of frames that you want uh, into uh, in there. So like you see like two frames forward and the opacity always going down and two frames backwards in this case too. Yeah, it seems like a pretty cool effect. I know I've never used it. This is like one of the first times I've ever seen it. Yeah. So I agree. And I think like, yeah, just having it on top of posterized time is also great because you have like this kind of, Let me see. The scene is so heavy. Yeah, it was pre rendered, but it, it, you can see here, like, so there's a bigger step uh, between the those two frames because of the posterized time. So I think it helps uh, give away the, the effect too. Yeah, it looks really cool. I know, like, when I first saw it, uh, when, when I saw the effect, I was like, my goodness, did he, like, duplicate this and then offset, like, time? And I was like, man, I'm, like, kind of nervous about opening this file. It's going to make my computer explode. So it's very cool that that's like an effect that you can kind of add to stuff. It's, it seems like it's kind of fun to play with as well. Um, you know, increasing and turning down those backwards and forward steps is pretty cool. Yeah, I love love to use it when I'm doing like whole frame animation, like some kind of frame by frame here. Because like I'm using, I'm used like when I do cell, I'm used to use on end skin to see like the trajectory that things are going, if the animation is working or not. And I kind of missed that in After Effects before knowing about it. So that. That's usually why I use it for it, but then Greg came up with the, the idea of using it here too, and I think it works really well. 
I love it. And I know like you've got that lens effect uh, on that that one piece. I know you and I were, were talking about somehow that got turned off in the final render, which is a huge bummer because I know seeing it here <laughs> now, is I love it. Um, but yeah, that, that distortion and compositing effect as the shapes like go behind um, really turned out really, really cool. I mean, I think even with that effect off, it still looked pretty neat, but um, that was just one extra thing that, that you did that I thought was, was really, really cool. Uh, yeah, that like remember like when I said like it was I didn't really know what to do in the beginning, so I I I, I saw this lens effect and I I just I had to make it work, so I spent like uh, a bit of time just trying different combinations of things. Uh, I don't know. So taking a step so, back, so I know. Taking a step back, did you did you do any like motion tests or anything early on as you were like kind of like because it seems like you kind of knew this was the way you were wanting to go. Did you have any like trials or tests that that didn't turn out so great? Yeah. Uh, so like, so this is one of the first motion tests. See that the motion is really bad, but because I was trying to focus more on the the statics first. Uh, I know that's usually not what you should do because it makes the scene very very heavy uh, quickly. But I don't know. I just had I had to make this uh, the lens work, and I I know. I was going to work a lot with the lightning. So I spent more time recreating the shapes, the layer styles, and making the, the lens before like adding movement. Well, it seems like, I mean, the animation itself is generally basic. Like, you know, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's kind of like you just have that one central object that rotates everything around. So, you know, getting that like initial vibe, like early on to influence like the, the thought and ways in which you'd approach it later, I think was actually pretty smart. Um, because it's like, you know, Hey, these are kind of like the pieces that I have to play with. They kind of will function and act in this way. So, you know, I, I always feel like any kind of motion test or reference is always like a super good idea. Um, just because, you know, you're setting yourself up for success and sometimes you can avoid failures down the line. So, um, very, very cool to see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this world rotation thing was just something else that I, you know, like, Sometimes it's hard to like to like have the, convince yourself that this is working. So just adding this extra step of like rotating everything helped sell to me the time lapse effect. And I don't know. Uh, one of the references I had in mind is like the Thor Ragnarok, the Valkyrie scene. So I'm mean, not sure if you remember or not, but yeah, yeah, uh, the one where it's like the light is like kind of like rotating around them as they're like yeah. in combat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's like so, yeah, that same kind of like you know time passing effect. You know, you kind of have here with that the layer style rig. Um, can we yeah. can we look at that null a little bit more in depth? That's kind of driving everything. Oh yeah, sure. So this is the this is the guy. Uh, so basically you have this light source and this is just a control that I used to reference and see like what was working, uh, like reference the results of, of the expression. It's not really being used, but basically, so like you can, as you can see, like there are keyframes here uh, and also this expression, but the, the keyframes were just for, from early tests. Oh, so since I rigged everything to, the, to this null, I like experimented like shifting the uh, shifting it around and see how the light would move. Uh, and then once I got the world rotation done, I linked uh, uh, this to the rotation of the node too. So everything's connected. So the world world rotating and the lights rotating at the same time in the, in the same pace. That's cool. So the in the end, the keyframes are not being used anymore because it's being overridden by the by the expression. And uh, what 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 I think is interesting here too is that I'm using linear expression just so I connect. Uh, uh, so the I'm using like so I have the this rotation going like this much, and then I don't want this uh, angle go like beyond or above uh, my negative 29 and positive 29 just because of the way because like if it go goes past 29 the light rig would bre would break just because of the way layer styles uh, would work so if you come in here 
I see this going like too much. I wouldn't look well in the end piece. So when I, I didn't want to see it like this happening there, you know. I see. So it's like you wanted that light source always coming from a direction, even though it was moving. Yeah. So that's why, like, and ev so everything like is rigged with this like linear expression here, which is really simple. But I think it helps a lot doing simple things fast too. So you don't have to think a lot. Uh, if can you walk through like you know when you type out like linear you know parenthesis r comma zero like what are what are those values linked to? Oh yeah. Uh, so. R is the rotation that I'm grabbing from uh, the no rotation, the Y rotation here. And is uh, this is a modulo, modulus, I don't know how to say it, uh, 360. So, cause I don't want it go past 360. So it goes like kind of loops. So it goes through zero to 360 and it goes back to zero. Oh, I see. And then uh, it's just, so zero, the uh, minimum. So everything that is zero is, uh, it goes turns into negative twenty nine. Everything that is one hundred eighty goes uh, turns into twenty nine, and everything in between, in a linear fashion. And then yes. there's this if expression here, because like I want it to go one way when it's uh, from zero to one hundred eighty, and the other way if it's uh, one hundred eighty one to three sixty. I see. So it's like you're setting your caps for its rotational values when it's below 50% of the rotation or above 50% of the rotation to basically- Yeah, and it goes back and forth. Right. It's like you're converting these values into basically stay at negative 29 is my max negative value and then positive 29 is my max value the other direction. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, uh, yeah, man. Then everything is linked to this. So- if you look at the uh, the particles here too, they're all uh, linked. the The world is linked to the rotation of the node too, and everything. So, so even so even in the, the was thing. that a particular in that one yeah. one comp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's particular, and I have two instances. A bit like the one in the back and the one there's a one in the front too. Uh, which are basically duplicates, but one has like a uh, you know like you can just set up for it to vanish at a point. So you have like half of it, half of the world showing in the back and then the other duplicate that is in front showing just like the front of the world. Did you link any of the world? Because I know you've got like some, it seems like lens effects where things close or super far from camera get blurred a little bit. Did you do that manually or was that like a parameter set? Like, for example, I know like in par uh, particular, I think you can do that. But as far as like yeah. even like the big shapes themselves, like how did you deal with that? Yeah, not, not for particular, it's, it's not. It's just that it's on comp and it's not linked to the camera at all. Uh, but for everything else, uh, there's a camera here with a uh, like. Uh, some blur, but yeah. What and happens when you change your your view from active camera to like that custom view? I'm interested to see what that looks like. Uh, I don't remember now. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. So I yeah, I everything is really rotating around. I thought it would be easier to do it this way, but like one interesting thing is that like. Since I have this uh, this lens effect, which is an adjust adjustment layer, so what what an adjustment layer does to your three D hierarchy is that it breaks it. So everything that is below the the adjustment layer would be like under uh, behind, and everything that is above the adjustment layer would be uh, on top of everything. Uh, regardless of the 3D space, uh, 3D position it is in. So what I had to do here was that I duplicated every single object uh, that is rotating around it. And basically when it's, when it's uh, in front, it's uh, uh, it, when like its world position is higher than zero, it's gonna be well, if, if it's the, the front one, it's going to be 100%. And if it's if the world position is less than zero, it's going to be the opacity will turn to zero. 
so we don't have to manually uh, keyframe the opacity. That's smart. Because I feel like if I was doing that, I would have totally done that manually. So in building this, what would you say was like probably like the biggest pain point? I mean, it seems like you've got a lot of expressions here. Like, what, was there any like troubles in, in figuring out like how necessarily to do something or like, did you learn anything new? Uh, sure. Uh, I guess I was always figuring out how, how to make this. Uh, the biggest thing of this was the time lapse effect. And I, I mean, I had some idea of what things would, could help do the trick, but I didn't really know what would work or not. So it was a lot of trial and errors and just like sharing my progress with the team to have, have feedback and get their idea, their ideas too. Uh, also like, I know some expression, but I'm not really an expert in it. So there's a lot of like rewriting and trying to figure out how like a simple thing would work or not. Um, even like the, the way I wrote this if statement here, like, I never remember how to do this, so I always I'm always googling expressions and like, I mean I kind of know what some some because we get used to some things, so like I knew I wanted to do some things and I just like searched and it's like them. one of the best ways to learn. You know, obviously taking classes from school motion is a great way to learn as well. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I know Googling, like if you have like a challenge like that, cause I know like, cause I see expressions in like a project like this. And to me personally, like I don't really use lots of expressions. I mean, I have like a, a handful, but like I see a ton in here that are incredibly useful. Um, it's almost like, I feel like we could do like a crash course on, on, you know, just expression writing itself. Um, but yeah, it's really cool For to sure. see how there's like in this program, there's so many different ways to do the same thing, but expressions is such a powerful way to, to make your life easier. Um, so it seems like, you know, you built this in a very clever way to where it's, you know, you knew it would be heavy, you knew you had the lighting stuff, and then it's, you know, threading all those things together to be linked to just a few keys is, is pretty cool. Yeah, well... Thank you. Uh, yeah, that wasn't really a yeah. question. I was just praising your expression skills, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, like, like I said, I, I don't really know what I'm doing like with expressions. So I've just like, I, I have a document that I always refer to uh, when I'm doing some things and I, I know what is there and what I can use. And if I don't know something or if I don't know if, I don't know if this thing can be, can be made or not. I probably ask around, probably Greg, because he's the expression uh, mastermind here in the office. No, you, you guys are, are spoiled to have him. He seems like he knows the program in and out like nobody else does. It's pretty cool. So I know like this was, um, uh, you know, a cross co collaboration project, not only in between, you know, us and, and you guys, but also, you know, Emily was, was a part of it. And I think what's cool is that, you know, our, our, both of our businesses, we do lots of work with lots of freelancers. So I don't know if it was any different for you, but was there anything in this process that felt like new and different or fun as far as collaboration is concerned? Oh, of course. Uh, just like seeing the work of everybody working on it was just incredible. Uh, Everything, everyone was so quick, I think, too. Uh, and I know also something different, too, is that I've been working with Jorge for so long now that, like, it was, like, different uh, getting directions from some, somebody else. So that was kind of cool, too. And it's, I know, it's also, uh, it's a cool part of the job, just, like, learning to, like, hear and trying to address others, uh, other people's comments. Totally. Yeah, that's, it's always something cool, too, because I know, like, as... On this project, you know, feedback from from us was more or less just basically aligning back to the brief, or just trying to keep the idea maybe simplified or, or whatever it could be. But I know, like even like your your first passes of work, I was like, oh, like even everybody on this project was just like, oh man, it's just, it's really cool to get to see so many people that are so incredibly talented coming together for a cause and just doing some just cool visuals. If if I could do these projects year round, I would, but. Uh, you know, we gotta gotta make some money sometimes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and also something interesting too, like like you said, like the first pass you saw was good already. That's because like I've been sending like earlier passes to the team here, right? So so you only saw the one that like the team liked, and then like send it to you. 
yeah so dude and that's that's, what, <laughs> that's one thing that's really cool about collaboration in general and i think like that could be you know one takeaway for sure is that you know as, as an artist or a freelancer like if you don't have you know say like a, a team that you're working with on a project having like a group of peers that you can just share work with and be like hey like what are your thoughts on this because you know sometimes your first idea isn't always your best idea and also just getting that additional input from others is sometimes huge um, because you know everybody has different cultural influence different um, uh, teaching when it comes to direction or artistic style so having like a handful of different influences can sometimes create a piece that's better than what you would have initially thought on your own so that's huge like i mean when you talk about like you know passing it around to the team uh and then you know obviously we, we passed around in the slack with with all the creatives that we were working with on that project it's really cool like when you get any project like that that could have so much input from so many talented people so i that for me personally like just getting to to work with so many like highly uh talented artists uh was was just incredible and I, I wish i could do it every day so trying to build more and more of those relationships obviously you got to honor the the nda process if you're doing client work but if you're ever just doing personal projects or anything like that and you can bounce ideas off others um hugely impactful it and not only furthering yourself but also could challenge you in ways in which you didn't previously think i know like even me seeing like you know files like this from you i feel like like, man, I need to brush up on my expression skills um, and maybe build my projects a little bit smarter sometimes. So, you know, that's not something that I would have thought of if, if we hadn't done this. So, you know, that's just one example of, of many, I would say. So very, very exciting stuff. Yeah. And I would say like the moment I really noticed at the time Labs Effect was working was uh, it's like when I shared it on the COVID uh, Slack channel. It's like before I showed to a handful of people and they all knew what this was supposed to be. So and then like when I posted and somebody knew see saw it and oh right, this is a time lapse. So Yeah dude. Okay. Very this cool. is working. <laughs> yeah, dude. It, it turned out so great. Again, thank you guys so much for your all's time on this project. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm humbled that we get to work with such awesome people doing such such a cool project. So thanks again for your time. And um, uh, I know if anybody else that worked on the project is listening, thanks for, for your time as well. I know everybody that worked on this was such a rock star. I would uh, go back and do it all again if I could. Maybe we can we can find another project like this. Hopefully not another pandemic. Maybe we could do yeah. something that's a little bit more happy. Uh, <laughs> for but, sure. But, you know, maybe just mm. as beautiful, if nothing else. So, very awesome. Yeah, but thank you so much for having me, uh, not only here, but also in the project, too. It was a blast working with you all. Thanks again to the School of Motion for having us on. This video is just one of three motion design walkthroughs. Make sure you check out the others, and if you'd like to check out the entire set of animations produced on this project, head over to thefurrow.tv slash project slash COVID-19. Also head over to the School of Motion to find more articles, tutorials, podcasts, and courses built for beginner to advanced motion designers. You can learn how to plan and execute projects in Explainer Camp, learn how to create and illustrate mood boards and illustration for motion, or learn the fundamentals of animation in Animation Bootcamp. I hope you all enjoyed the content. Give the School of Motion some love by hitting the like button and subscribe if you want some more motion design training.